And it's two minutes after the hour of 6 o'clock. You're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. My name is Lauren Schoenberg, and it's a very special edition of The Musician's Show tonight as we welcome back Mel Lewis for part three of our continuing series on the history of jazz drums. Let's begin, though, with one of jazz's greatest drummers who we're not going to get into great depth tonight and that's our guest mel lewis and this is mel lewis's band from the album 20 years at the village vanguard the 20th anniversary album on atlantic records this is an original called the interloper <laughs> Thank you. 
And we heard the very identifiable sound of the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra from the album 20 Years at the Village Vanguard on the Atlantic record label recorded in March 1985, over four years ago. And we heard the Interloper, Thad Jones' original, and we heard Joe Lovano on the tenor saxophone and Kenny Werner on the piano, and of course the leader, the one only Mel Lewis. And I'd like to welcome Mel Lewis back to KCR and say it's a pleasure to have you back. And uh, you've been out of the country quite a bit recently. Yeah, Lauren, I've been out like uh, almost too much, really. I mean, it, it would be nice to be home more often and uh, to be able to play here more, you know. But it seems that's that's uh, where all the work is for for jazz musicians. Uh, is uh, as what you've many of you people have heard this spoken about by many other uh, jazz players uh, th that we have to we have to run to Europe an awful lot to to make a living. So. Uh, and that includes me, and I've, of course, been out uh, many times. But it's been good, you know, it's been good, I enjoy it, you know. And uh, the band I work with mostly, aside from my, you know, aside from my own band, and your band, <laughs> which are the only two bands I really work with here in New York, are, uh, <clears throat> is the Cologne Radio Band, which is a darn good band. It's really developed, thanks to people like Bob Brookmeyer and Bill Holman and uh, myself and... Uh, and uh, Bob Mincer's been going over there a little bit, and uh, a few, uh, uh, Jim McNeely. Uh, we have turned that band into a into a first-rate band. So it's not so bad. I enjoy it. And, and Jerry, a guy named Jerry, a wonderful musician from Holland by the name of Jerry Von Ryan, is their uh, is their conductor. And of course, he's helped it tremendously too. And the band has developed into a good band. I think it's as good as anything you could find. Yeah. Certainly, the best in Europe. There's no without a doubt. I know one thing, it's the best job in, a, in the world. Those guys make a, I mean, they're, it's the most secure jazz, big band uh, job in the world. I don't know anything better. Ah, sorry about that. <laughs> We've been swinging the microphone around because we only had one mic in the studio, but during that last mic break, the second mic arrived. So we're going to get to the beginning of our history of the jazz drums part three right now, in which we play records by some of them some and i have to say some because we're undoubtedly leaving out some people but you can only do so much in so much time some of the most significant and important jazz drummers in jazz history and again having mel comment on the recordings and just uh, having a nice listening session compounded by mel's insight into the drumming so why don't we get right to it we'll begin with davy tuff we'll just begin with a recording where it's kind of atypical actually there's none of the symbol not much of the symbol work that was so much a part of his sound this is him on the brushes with the benny goodman quartet with uh, lionel hampton gene krupa and teddy wilson uh, teddy wilson lionel hampton and uh, benny goodman and of course dave tuff on the drums and i guess the most immediate comparison to this title is the benny goodman quartet with gene krupa let's listen how dave tuff made it sound different on dizzy spells <laughs> Thank you. 
there we had it, the original recording of Dizzy Spells from 1938, the Benny Goodman Quartet, with Benny Goodman, Lionel Hampton, Teddy Wilson, and Dave Tuff on the drums. And now, now when, you know, when you hear Dave, uh, you know, as opposed to your people used to hearing Gene uh, with, with that group. Now, Gene was heavier. Uh, Dave was much lighter. And, uh, and, uh, and he was also, he was crisper uh, on, on the brushes, on the snare drum. Uh, and, and it was very strange because actually uh, Dave liked to use a, a very loose sounding drums, but on these, the drums sound like they were, uh, of course, you know, in those days it was calfskin heads, and the drummer did not always have all the control he wanted. Mm-hmm. It might be, uh, it might be, if it's a dry day, you can loosen them, but they'll still be on the tight side no matter what. And if, it, and if it's a damp day, no matter how much you tighten them, they're still going to be damp. They're going to have yeah. a, a looser sound. And that sounded like a dry day. Yeah. And uh, but it sounded great, you know. And if you also notice that his bass drum, which he played in four all that all the way, was also right there up on top of it. Yeah. And uh, the whole thing was uh, the whole thing just skimmed along. Probably that, that's that's one of the that's one of the best uh, quartet bassless versions of anything I think I've ever heard from that group. Yeah. Because it because it just uh, it, it it was so effortless. Yeah. You know. Dave's foot was just, you know, no problem at all. There was no, there was no giving up at any point. Yeah. And because uh, drummers were not used to playing up tempos in those days, four to the bar, they really weren't, you know, because when they had to play something really fast, they played in two beat. So yeah. uh, I mean, they didn't have to play four four. Probably Buddy Rich was the only guy that ever did that, really on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Everybody else sort of just went into that two. Yeah. In fact, most of the arrangements were written that way bass player played in two also yeah in fact the faster the tempo the the more two there was <laughs> where did the in terms of where di- different drummers place the beat now for for instance later on in the show we're going to be listening to i know one of your favorites shadow wilson <clears throat> who really seemed to be lay back on uh, his time seemed to be on the more on the on the uh, triplet v- well, variety shadow where, shadow where do you play yeah well shadow shadow was a layback drummer i mean he, he uh he sat right on the bottom you know yeah uh which is, to me is the correct place to play. That's where it's supposed to be. You know, I mean, uh, where, but, uh, Dave yeah, was yeah. close to that, but he wasn't quite, because Dave, see, Dave was such a Dave, in, especially in those days. You know, Dave had to play. A, Dave worked a lot without a bass. Uh, uh, practically every drummer that came up in those days uh, came up playing without bass players, including myself. I mean, I, I learned to play drums with. I didn't know what a bass was till I was a teenager. You know, and then. Yeah. Then I didn't hit too many great bass players at that time, you know. But not till I came to New York, actually. There was only a couple of decent bass players in Buffalo. But, uh, and they were decent, but they weren't great. And they disagreed with me constantly because I was dragging, as they said. And I used to say, no, no, you just You're rush. rush. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the way we got along, which wasn't too good. Yeah. But, uh, but when a drummer really had to carry it by himself, he developed... Where he felt, that's where it stayed. And from then on, that's pretty much the way he played. Mm-hmm. And Dave was uh, coming out of that Chicago scene and the whole thing, played a lot of Dixieland, uh, where the time has to be really crisp. Yeah. You know. That's a perfect lead into our next track, which is um, a Bud Freeman record session from uh, July 23rd, 1940, that has some great Dave Tuff on it. But before we get to that, uh, what about the about the discipline of playing a you know an up tempo record of making a record like that up tempo but yet sticking to the brushes and not getting into the more flashy work with the sticks and everything? Well, that would be no problem because frankly most drummers hated to change from sticks to brushes because it was always made a lot because it was it, that's a hard thing to do while you're recording. You used to go nuts trying to figure out how am I going to do this without dropping anything. Yeah, you know really it, it was always a pain to me. I used to. You know, like, how am I going to do this now? Because you can't do it. You can't drop anything. You can't make any noise. You know, they were terrible about things like that. Yeah. And uh, so he was probably just as happy. What are the options that a drummer has uh, as to what kind of beat you can play? When you're playing a tempo that fast and you're limiting yourself, not limiting, but you're, you're, you're just going to play on the brushes on the snare drum, uh, what kind of beat was Davey playing there? Davey was playing a straight four. And that was probably the smartest thing to do because... Uh, uh, you know, Davey did not have what you'd call fancy. He didn't have fantastic chops. Now, if he would have had, uh, if he had the kind of chops that could play down, for that, for you know, for three minutes, at that tempo, if he could just have done it, 
uh, fine, but th that wasn't his kind of drumming. So what he just played was straight four, but it was so nice and even, and because he had a good swish going against it with the left hand, so it was, you know, and, and with the four on the bass drum and, and, yeah. and, and, a, and a very, uh, probably, I don't even know if there was a hi-hat on two and four, because in those days. I didn't hear it much. No, I didn't hear it either. That's why I say I don't think, I don't even think there was. But uh, there was just an, he put enough accent with the right hand, with the brush itself on two and four, that uh, you didn't need it. It was just swinging, and, and, and it was swinging all the way anyway. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's the smart, it's still the smart way. I still like the feeling of four on brushes. I love that feeling. I, I, I don't even like playing down, da ka down, da ka da either on brushes. I think nothing is groovier than when a bass and the bass drum and the brushes with a with a with a with a with a with the swish the swish of the left hand and the right hand and just straight four is a beautiful sound especially when it's all hitting together oh yeah i mean it, it's uh, and if it's soft and, and and just hits right on the bottom i mean there's nothing like it there's a there's a certain groove that you can hit doing that 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 puts away all all other brush feels because just showing how fast you can play, da -da 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 -da, who cares, you know, really. Yeah. You know, and I've heard some of these brush players that just thrive on playing, ding -ding 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 -ding. so what? Who cares? Yeah, yeah right. Because if it ain't swinging, who, who gives a damn? Yeah. 22 minutes after 6, that's the voice of Mel Lewis. And again, Mel is our guest on the Musician Show tonight here on WKCR FM in New York. We're coming to you in stereo. And we're going through the history of jazz drums. We're talking about Davy Tuff, and Mel mentioned that he first really came to prominence playing a more uh, well playing with Tommy Dorsey's band with Bud Freeman and Tommy Bunny Dorsey Berrigan. Tommy Dorsey and uh, I saw him the first. I saw him. You know who I saw him with Charlie Spivak. Right. And uh, and I saw him with Tommy Dorsey, of course. And I saw him yeah. with Woody. And uh, yeah. And uh, I, I never really got to see him with small groups because by the time I hit uh, because when I hit New York, it was '48 when yeah, I came was... to New York with Alvino Ray's band. That's when he died. Yeah. So I never got to I never got to know Davy Tuff at all. Yeah. I mean, I I saw him, but I never got to meet him or really know him at all. Yeah. Well, right now we're going to hear uh, him with a band that was quite popular in 1939, 1940. Bud Freeman and his Summer Come Laude band, uh, written music arranged by the great Brad Gowans and also Max Kaminsky, Pee Wee Russell, and uh, Bud with the horns and uh, Dave Bowman and uh, Eddie Condon and. Uh, Morty Stoolmaker on the bass, along with Dave Tuff on drums. And this is the conception that really uh, people most readily identified Davy Tuff with before, before the great Woody Herman first heard, which we'll be hearing in just a few minutes. So right now, let's hear Shimmy Shawabble, one of these great tracks with great time, great Bud Freeman. And again, we're going to focus in on the drum work of Dave Tuff.
Yeah. Now, see that, now that there's a good example of, of of great symbol work that that you're hearing it there. Actually, I heard uh, that's the same kind of symbol work he he, he uses on uh, later on in, in, in Woody's band. Uh, uh, small hi hats, they're they're uh, eleven or twelve inch, very thin cymbals, and, uh, and and a lot of crashes on, on on little small cymbals he's got spread around, which is the way Dave always set up. He always had three, four, five little crash cymbals, and then he had that one Chinese ride cymbal which he used which he used on this record also, uh, because they didn't really have ride cymbals in those days, and uh, about you know uh, Zildjian had this really started making them yet and uh, I mean they were making them but they didn't know they were making them because nobody knew they were playing them yet right and they were still into small symbols nobody was into big symbols Chinese symbols were not made by the Zildjians or by the or by the symbol makers they were being made by the Chinese and they were used they had another purpose and drummers over here in America found another way to use them you know yeah which meant drill some holes in them and put some rivets or screws in there and get this rattly sound, which uh, which uh, some people liked and some didn't. Frankly, I loved it. I, to this day, I love it, and I, yeah. I'm probably one of the biggest exponents of it today. I think I actually brought the cymbal back. Uh, in fact, I know I did, to be honest, because the Zildjians insist I did, and I said, so, yeah, I know I did. But uh, Dave introduced it really m- probably more than anybody mm-hmm. uh, during the, during the uh, 40s. Yeah, uh, it was being used before that, but people like Joe Jones didn't use it. You know, Cozy Cole used it. Jimmy Crawford, with Lunsford, he used it. But then again, most of the time he used his hi hats. You know, and so did Dave. Did uh, uh, Frankie was, Carlson uh, had one? I think they all had one. But the, what, what they were uh, see, guys who played Dixieland used them. If you didn't play Dixieland, you didn't really have one. But Crawford had this thing going with the Lunsford band, with that two-beat thing. Yeah. And he he had one, he used a big one, he used to keep right up in the middle of a set of drums. And he used to just get on that thing, and he'd play that boom, gank a ding and he'd get on that thing, and it was marvelous, you know. Yeah. It gave an, because it's, it's a driving sound, you know. Yeah. It might sound funky, actually it's a funky sound, you know. So I love it, yeah. Oh, it's great. It, it, yeah. it complements instruments. Right, because it's down low. Because it's a low pitch symbol, yeah. yeah. It sounds like it's raining. Yeah. Yeah. But Dave, that was again. You heard that crispness, yet. Mm-hmm. But there, you heard the Dave Tough sound on him, like when he had a little snare drum solo at the end. Yeah. That was the sound he got on snare drum. I mean, you, that was that was that was a signature sound, definitely. That was Dave Tough. What do they mean when they talk about uh, the fact that back in those days, whenever a band leader would have a solo for Dave Tough to play, they'd have to twist his twist his arm to play it. He didn't want to play solos. That that, that really separated him from most. Well, Most drummers of those, no, I no? understood that because uh, I went through the same thing. It's uh, you know, see, every I, I used to fight with Ray Anthony over that kind of thing, and Tex Benneke didn't bother me about it too much. But uh, you know, you're a soloist or you're not a soloist, and most drummers who weren't soloists really hated him because what they really wanted was you. They really wanted you to play like Gene Krupa or or Buddy Rich. I mean, they wanted you to do that. That's what they wanted. The leaders did. They didn't want just a solo. They wanted a, a spectacular solo. Mm-hmm. They wanted speed and technique. And Dave Tuff just didn't believe in those kind of things. Dave believed in the musical aspect of drumming. He believed in swinging. And uh, he just didn't particularly care for showing off. And it's a show-off thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Buddy was born to it, you know. Uh, that was his thing. It was, uh, there was nobody ever better in the whole history of drumming. For that, starting as when he was a kid, so, and we all know that, so there's no point even going into it. That that was his thing, but, and he had to learn to do the other thing, to swing right. and play with a band. I mean, that that's that's what he had to learn to do. Yeah. Solo he could do. Krupa, wanted Krupa introduced the solo. It became a th- before Krupa soloing didn't mean anything. Chick Webb used to get away with an occasional solo at the Savoy Ballroom, but. Uh, to knock the people out, but basically, he was a uh, he soloed through the numbers. That's what you call busy drumming, you know. Right. Dave was one of those subtle swingers, and he didn't have those kind of chops, as we say. He wasn't into speed. He was a he was a, a natural drummer, yeah. and he wasn't about to spend two minutes showing off and uh, smiling and acting like he really had something going because he didn't have anything going. 
except if you listened. Flip Phillips he had told me. a lot me, going. <laughs> Flip Phillips told me that when the, there was this routine they used to do sometimes when the band was on the stage, that the guys would have to go back around where Dave Tuff was, and they'd all say, <laughs> they'd all say <laughs> Sure, yeah. well, he would hate things like that. Yeah. But, you know, like uh, they used to do, a, like, uh, you know, he'd get, he got stuck with different numbers, like, he got Golden stuck Wedding. playing Golden Wedding, you know, which Frankie Carlson made popular earlier. Uh, Frank Carlson was no great soloist either, but it was basically him and, I mean, I used to watch, the, I remember the early recording, it was just Tom Tom, Tom and clarinet and a little yeah. bit of cowbell and all that, you know. But by the time it reached the, the, third, uh, the first herd, Woody, Woody was into excitement, you know. And there's a there's a record or a tape out. I think there's a record out on uh, on Golden on Golden yeah, Wedding with Davey. where uh, Davy Tate plays a solo. Yeah. And if you listen to it, it's a very musical solo, but it's very dumb sounding as far as the drums. The drums sound yeah, damp and all that, yeah. and they're not tuned for soloing at all. They're as sloppy as could be. But to me, it was a beautiful solo. But you could hear you could tell that it wasn't it wasn't a crowd pleaser at all. It was a, it was for musicians. Yeah. And he said, all right, you want it, you got it. Here it is. Take it or leave it. Uh, Dave Tuff, I guess, uh, really... He was an intellect, you know. Came, he, was hmm? quite a, he was quite an intellect. Oh, yeah, and a great writer, you know. Yeah. His, his, his articles for Downbeat, uh, I have some of them at home, yeah, copies of them. Metronome. Great, metronome uh, metronome for Metronome. Yeah. yeah. Great articles, very witty and, and all that stuff. And uh, when I interviewed Bud Freeman, he said that Dave Tuff was the one who turned him on to modern art and modern painting and, and, and all. He was real. Oh, he, was, he, he was, knew all that yeah, stuff. Well, I, think, I think you can hear it in his drumming. That's, yeah. that's also very evident. Uh, I guess Dave Tuff, again, first came to fame with the uh, national fame as a member of the great Tommy Dorsey band in 36 and 37 with Bud Freeman and uh, Bunny Berrigan and all those guys. And then he, right, he flitted around from band to band. Most people don't know that he really took Gene Krupa's place with Benny Goodman there for a year. Yeah. And Spivak's band and Hal McIntyre's band back with Dorsey again. Then with the great band that Artie Shaw had with right. uh, Hot Lips Page and all them. And then he was in the Navy band with, uh, That's right. with uh, Artie Shaw. Right. And uh, I think he also played with Sam Donahue. That's and, right. And then... Uh, this amazing thing happened uh, that he got the call to replace, I guess it was, uh, I think Cliff Lehman had been in the in Woody's band, in Woody's band yeah. at that moment. Who was also a, a oh, yes. very underrated drummer. He was a marvelous yeah. drummer. I'm going to make a segment on our next show of uh, guys like you mentioned at the end of the last show we did, which was for several months ago. You started calling a whole bunch of names like Cliff Lehman and yeah. a lot of other folks who we don't have time to get to, but we're going to do a segment on some of them. Great. And one name but well, you mentioned I had never heard of, and I went back and did some, I was looking at some old uh, downbeats or metronomes, I forget which ones, for some Dave Tuff articles. And it turns out that back in the 30s, one of the drummers you named was a big guy because his ads were in all the downbeat issues, but now you never hear of him. Ormond Downs. Ormond Downs. When you said his name, I had never even heard that name. But oh, then when yeah. I looked at the advertisements, every month in the music magazine, big, yeah. you know, there's a p picture of him with his drums. And because all he was with Kay Kaiser. Yeah. But yeah. my God, what a job he did! And and, yeah. and the drum and all the musicians in New York dug him. I mean, yeah, yeah. the guy could play. Yeah. He was he was he was a swinger. So we're going to get to. A, but he had a good job. <laughs> he had a good gig. Yeah. So we're going to get to him and a whole bunch Great. of guys like that too. But uh, Chubby Jackson has has said many times that. Uh, that when Cliff had to leave the Woody Herman band, they were looking for a drummer. When Woody Herman said, I'll get Dave Tuff, they all said, oh, no, not that old Dixieland cat. And they yeah. had no idea what they were in for, and they were kind of set against it. And then he came in and, of course, made some history. Let's listen to some extremely well-recorded radio, rehearsal, radio rehearsals from 1944 of the Woody Herman first heard <clears> with... Uh, Flip Phillips and Bill Harris and Ralph Burns and the rest of them with Davy Tuff very well recorded. We'll hear a few titles beginning with It Must Be Jelly. Uh, no, uh, Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. Way you're acting lately makes me doubt. You Still my baby, baby Or's my flame in your heart done gone out Woman is a creature that always seems strange When you're sure of what you find She's gone and made a change Is you, is, or is you ain't my baby Baby, baby, found somebody new Is my baby Still my baby true 
That always seems strange When you show up one you find She's gone and made a change Is you is or is you ain't my baby Maybe baby's found somebody new Is my baby still my baby too All right. See, now you could see the control over the dynamics he had. Uh, the band knew what they had to do, but without the drummer doing the right things at the right times, I mean, he always like knew when to put that slam down and then come way down. Uh, the, the, the hi-hats were recorded beautiful. Yeah. Closed with a little, with a little ping. Yeah, that little ping you hear, that's, 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 that. that's the, that's the, the uh, rod of the hi-hat pedal. Which is hollow, of course, and it makes a little ringy sound. Right. That's another way, of, was another additional sound a drummer could use. Yeah. You know, hitting, you know, it's like hitting, uh, hitting anything that that's that, that's made of metal and rings. That's yeah. all. a tube. And uh, then when he opened up, he started opening up the hi hats a little bit as he was approaching an ensemble. Yeah. You know, then behind Flip Phillips, as he always did, he went to that Chinese symbol. Again. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was the rest of the time. It was hi hats. With, with splashes, he, his little fills were always with those little small symbols he had floating around. Yeah. Like before, same as he did on the Dixieland record before earlier, which was not really Dixieland, but yeah. That 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 is what we call. That, see, Dave, that was his signature. Yeah. You, when you knew when you heard all those things, you knew it was him. You know, that was his style. Yeah. And he used it no matter what band he was with or who he played with. These these things come out. Interesting, because we're going to find the same thing out about uh, Big Sid Catlett when we hear him play with Louis Armstrong with Charlie Parker and Dizzy. He's That's basically right. doing the same thing, but it's exactly. so great that it fits. It, yeah, it, it, it don't have to become a chameleon. No, you don't have to change that much. You got yeah. it. You got it. <laughs> you were talking about hearing drummers just use anything for a sound. I I saw Sonny Greer one night play uh, play the uh, window shades in a nightclub. Sonny During Greer's, a solo, we turned around, started playing the the shades behind them with the stick. You know, made it. You know, yeah, sure. It actually made it. They probably had some wrinkles in them or something, and yeah. you know, we could get a sound out of them. Yeah. Oh, sure. Why not? Nineteen minutes before seven. Let's hear some more Davy Tuff with Woody Herman. Let's hear Red Top. And uh, on this one, I'd like to just uh, point everyone's attention to the the bass drum and the fact that he's not doing any fills on those last chords. And when we come back, I'd like to ask Mel what he's doing to give the band such tremendous propulsion as we listen to Dave Tuff on Red Top.
Now, I'll tell you what actually happens. Yeah. Now, uh, this is something, you see, as they kept building, they start out, he, he's playing his bass drum easy, you know. Right. See, now, to, to tell you the truth, that rhythm section without Dave would have been terrible because Chubby, uh, with all his yelling and screaming and all that, and all that, he played very tight. I mean, he was very short notes and making all kinds, you know, beep, 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 beep. I mean, if I had to play with that kind of bass playing today, I'd go crazy, you know. But for the time, it was an exciting sound. See, right. as a unit, they made a sound. See, they couldn't be Count Basie's rhythm section, which was which doing the same thing was looser, but not much looser. See, without Joe Jones, they would have been on a tighter side too, except for Freddie Green, who strummed the guitar. Billy Bowers chokes that. That's a tick, tick, tick. he's not playing uh, those open chords like like Freddie right. Green did. They were creating another kind of excitement, another way, you know. Dave is what kept the whole thing happening and swinging, right. because he was the he was the experienced man that they didn't want, the old-fashioned guy that <laughs> made them sound good. Because without him, they would have been sounded terrible, actually. Yeah. See, then when Don Lamont came in later on, Don tried to carry on Dave's thing, although he had his own he had his own little little explosive way of playing. He found he tried to find his own little colors and all that, but basically he did the same thing. He didn't change much. He even set up the same. He even did the same kind. Of... Now, well, here's where the excitement comes from there. Dave kept his bass drum so loose, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I mean, we're talking about calfskin heads again. We're, plastic, has, thank God, hadn't been invented yet. I wish it never had been, frankly. But, uh, but it did, so we're stuck with it. I'm not. Most people are. Uh, he kept that head wet, see? Now and he also had a beater ball on his on his foot pedal that was hard as a rock. It was actually wrapped in it was it was like leather wrapped in tape. Adhesive mm -hmm. tape. So that when that thing hit, it wouldn't break the head. Although I'm sure he broke some heads. You know, because I saw all the, in those days a lot of guys broke heads. I don't know you know why I never broke a head? Why? Because I never played the bass drum that hard. Yeah. And I always used bigger I always used big beater balls. Without, I didn't use hard ones, yeah. but they had to get that sound. That was it. But you'll notice on the on that record, on that on that track, he keeps getting heavier and heavier. But it's not louder; it's stronger. Yeah, right. And it's it's a thud. It's a it's a sound. It's like a flat sound. Yeah. And it just keeps getting stronger and stronger yeah. as it goes on. And the drive, it's he's it just driving like crazy. Yeah. You know, and that's what it's all about. It all comes from the foot, and that's where the swing. That's what I've been emphasizing for years. When I tell drummers, man, the swing comes from your foot, not from your hands. It's your feet, and if your feet don't swing, you don't swing, and that's all there is to it, you know. And drummers who don't play bass drums, and there are thousands of them, don't swing. Practically all of them. The few that do, it's a, it's a, they're lucky. And and, I don't, and they don't swing consistently. You must play that bass drum. See, now in those days, the bass drum was that important. Today, it's a pulse you want to get. If you know how to handle your bass drum, you don't have to play that loud anymore. Besides, yeah. you got such wonderful bass players today. Yeah. You got, you got, you got some. You know, you don't need guitars anymore. We don't use them anymore for rhythm. But you could. But it's still nice to play with a rhythm guitar if you can find somebody that knows how to do it. Play nice and light. There aren't yeah. too many. You know, it's very few who know how to do it. Yeah. And uh, but that means the piano player's got to know how to play with that guitar also. I mean, everybody's got to know how to do it. Uh, the basic rhythm section was the best for that. You know, they they was nobody like them. The old rhythm section, not the later one. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, because if you listen close, like in the '50s, the great band of the '50s, the Basie's band, that rhythm section was half the time was never together. Eddie Jones was way on top. Uh, Freddie Green was way behind. Sonny Payne was falling asleep. You know, I mean, everybody said, oh, how great he was. He was, he was flashy. Right, but... But he wasn't great. It you was know, no not, Gus not, Johnson. Not that he, Gus Johnson was much better. Yeah. That he belonged there. Because Gus could swing. That's when the section really sounded good. You know, credit's got to be given where it's due. Sonny Payne was a flash, but he didn't... 